Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our cons special consideration this day is written for us in St. Luke's Gospel, the 16th chapter, the first 13 verses. Jesus also said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager who was accused of wasting his possessions. The rich man called him in and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, what will I do? Since my master's taking away the management position from me, I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I will do, so that when I am removed from my, ma from my position as manager, people will receive me into their houses. He called each one of his master's debtors to him. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 600 gallons of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 300. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, 600 bushels of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 480. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of the light are. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon, so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into the eternal dwellings. The person who is faithful with very little is also faithful with much. And the person who is unrighteous with very little is also unrighteous with much. So if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will entrust you with what is really valuable? If you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you something to be your own? No servant can serve two masters. Indeed, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, have you ever noticed that there are some words we use just at church and then nowhere else in real life. And I'm not talking about like the these and thys and some of the, the songs, the doth and makest and takest and, and whatever that are in some of the, uh, some of the older hymns. I'm talking about, about church words of stuff like justification, sanctification, and we throw those around and, and we know what they are, but have you ever used any of those words out in the world in real life? Or here's one, stewardship. Have you ever used that word or even heard that word anywhere else except for in church? I know there's stewards, there's shop stewards, right, in the labor, labor union and stuff like that. And they used to have stewards and stewardesses on, on airplanes. And, but stewardship? Even in the middle or old English of the King James Version of the Bible, this word stewardship, it only shows up in this one chapter in the Bible. So it's one of those words we don't really use, do we know what it means? I mean, I should be able to figure this out, right? I've been teaching English as a second language for the last 20 some years. I should be able to break this down for us and we shall be able to get it. So, so stewardship, I, I see stew right on the front. I know what that is because I like to eat. It's some kind of a meat soup, right? With not so much soup and more meat, like, like a beef stew or, or maybe that hunter stew with the pork and sausage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, the next part, the Ard, and I look in through the dictionary, I don't see anything that even looks close to that. The closest thing I see is aardvark. I don't know, anybody ever eat aardvark? I hear it tastes like chicken, but maybe it has, we'll put that in the stew, okay? So some kind of aardvark stew in the last word, ship. That's like some kind of a big boat or something, right? So you put that all together, and it still doesn't make any sense. But fortunately, the stuff that we really, really must know, that, that we really need to know, our God makes that known to us. He tells us that he makes it known for us, that he makes it make sense for us. That's what his whole word, that's what the Bible is actually all about. So here this morning, Jesus, our God in his word, tells us the skinny about this thing called stewardship. What stewardship actually is. Only the word he uses here, in the original language, it looks closer to our English word economy. Economy, is a, it's a Greek word, and it really means the rule of the house. 
Uh, it's a word that has to do with management of possessions or administration of, of resources. So this thing called stewardship means that in God's economy of things, it's administration of resources. Something that God makes us managers of. That God puts us into this redeemed life. He created us the first time, and then he recreated us by making us his children, and now he puts us as managers or an administration position over all of his stuff, and that's all the things that go along with the life he's given us. Now, to understand that a little better, Jesus tells us a story about what it means to be one of these managers, and yet his story is kind of weird because for his example, he doesn't give you that, that hardworking farmer that gets up at the crack of dawn and puts in an honest day's work every day, day after day, and then goes home and sleeps so, so satisfied that, that he's done his best. And, and he doesn't use the example of someone who goes after degrees and gets this accounting degree and, a, and a, a, an MBA and, and some kind of a personnel or, or whatever degrees and resources. And No, he picks a scoundrel. He picks this, this guy who is a conniving con man. Remember that, um, that scandal of the city manager in the city of Bell in Los Angeles County just a few years back? Nobody remembers? Well, look it up sometime. Not now. Put your phones away, please. But this, this guy was just a con man, and he was cheating, and he was taking in money on the side. And yet that's who Jesus uses in his story for how we get to be managers of all God's stuff. The dishonest manager, the unrighteous manager, and yet this con man is a model of what God tells us, how we're supposed to be managers of his stuff. Well, yeah, we're supposed to manage God's possessions, first of all, as someone who knows we have to give an accounting for our management. That it comes time when we have to open the books. Because just like with the manager in Jesus' story, none of it is our stuff. It all belongs to the master, whether we call it buy, sell, rent, inherit, a gift from, from family or inheritance. Whatever we like to call it, it still belongs to God. And we're just taking care of it for him for a while. The truly amazing thing is that he lets us take care of so much of his stuff. And then he gives us such wide latitude in, in how we go about taking care of his things. I mean, he's not there micromanaging every step. He doesn't give us, okay, here's this week's budget, or even this year's budget for your time or your money or your possessions. He doesn't even make us get his signature for our checks. We just get to pretty much be on the honor system but he does hold us accountable. Jesus says there was a rich man who had a manager who was accused of wasting his possessions. He called to him, called him in and said, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management. Okay, so this manager, this administrator, he had squandered the resources. He had used them, the same word that Jesus uses for the prodigal son, the way he went off and wasted his resources in, in wild and sinful living. Now, I don't know how this guy thought he was going to get away with it in the first place, any more than any of us think we're getting away with it when we're squandering the Lord's resources of time and money and whatever other resources that he gives to us as if we can, oh yeah, we can just do whatever we want with them and and the books are never going to be open. What if those books were open right now? I mean, you want anybody in here to see how you have used personally all the Lord's resources that he's blessed you with? I don't. I don't want people that I like and, and admire and that probably used to like and admire me. I don't want them seeing some of, some of the things in, in my accounting book, the, the selfish motives the greedy motives for things I've done, every episode of, of insincerity or, or, or dishonesty, every bit of laziness or, or lack of integrity in anything I've done or used from God, I wouldn't want people to see that. And fortunately, they don't. But there is someone who sees that. And he's not just talking about the books being open all at Judgment Day. He's talking about always, all the time, the one master of everything sees our books all the time. In Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us this God is like this. Everything is uncovered and exposed to his eyes. 
to the one to whom we will give an account. We're supposed to see here that we are all God's managers, but we're accountable. We're accountable to God and also that he wants us to act shrewdly, wisely with what he has given us. See, when this, this manager, this wasting, shrewd manager, finds out he's getting the pink slip, man, the wheels are really rolling inside his brain. He's got to think of something else to do. He's searching the one ads. Yeah, yeah, there's an opening for ditch diggers. I'm a little too old and too out of shape for that, too, so I understand. Yeah, that not, that's not my thing. I, physically, that's not acceptable. And how about getting a piece of cardboard and a, and a big marker and, and writing something on it and standing on the freeway off-ramp or at the, over at, in front of the mall or something? Well, socially, that's a little unacceptable. I'm, not, I'm a little too proud for that. And yet his mind keeps going and his scheming little mind comes up with just the right plan. So he comes up with this idea to call in everybody that has an account with his master. And as he calls them in, he starts drastically reducing what they owe. And I, I notice here the way, the way Jesus tells it that everyone who comes in, they're only expected to give from what they have. So the guy with the olive oil, he's only expected to give the olive oil. And the guy with the wheat, he's only expected to, to give back in, in wheat. Oh yeah, kind of the way that God does this with us. He only expects from us what he has given to us, but he does expect from that. Anyways, back to this story. So this dishonest manager, this lying, conniving manager, he gets on everybody's good side by drastically reducing their debts, and then, of course, they're going to feel obligated to help him later on. And that makes this guy the, the hero of the story. Jesus says, so the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Oh, he's still a crook. He's still the dishonest manager. I know the heading in the Bible says the shrewd manager, but it doesn't say that anywhere in God's holy word. God didn't write those little headings to the paragraphs. The only thing Jesus ever calls him is the dishonest manager, the unrighteous manager. But he's commended. Why? Not for being dishonest, not for being a cheat, not for his creative way of being able to cook the books, but it says because he acted shrewdly. He thought about what might happen next. He was making provision for the future. He recognized what his priority had to be, and he put everything into accomplishing that. That's what he was commended for. Now, Jesus makes the, the, the real connection and brings that to light for us who are still kind of wandering in the fog here when he says this is about the eternal dwellings to come the eternal dwellings to come where there's no way to buy or earn your way in. There's no way to connive or schmooze or, or sweet talk your way in. There is only one way in. And only God could do that way. And he did. It's this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's God the son. The son of God who came here to be our perfect substitute in keeping and taking care of all God's business perfectly in our place. And then when it comes time to show the books, he had a way of erasing all the bad marks, all the debts, all the, the red marks in our books by innocently suffering and dying in our place. That Jesus, our holy God tells us, is the only way into this thing called the eternal dwellings. Oh, then it's not so hard to see where Jesus is going with all this. This isn't about finding creative ways to make people like you. This is about single-minded a purpose, having a priority, making sure the future is taken care of. Like this conversation, real or imagined, that could happen with any number of people where you say, so what are you planning to do, right? What are you going to do with your life? We always ask the young people what they're going to do with their life. What do they tell us? Oh, I'm going to go to this university. I'm going to get these skills. I'm going to do that. And then what? Well, then, of course, I'm going to get a job in this field. And then what? Well, maybe I'll get married and have a couple kids, right? And then what? Then they're going to move up the ladder in their job, or they're going to make their own business and, and, and be their own boss. And, and then what? Well, of course, then they're going to build up financial security. They're going to, going to make sure their kids get in the right schools, and they're going to put a, a side money so their kids can be in college, and they're going to put aside money so they can retire too. And then what? After that, 
well, eventually they're going to be done working. They're going to retire, right? And then what after that? Oh, well, we got all this money saved up, and we got this 401k, and we got all these. We're going to travel the world. We're going to see our grandkids. We're going to enjoy life and, and have a really good time. And then what? And you keep asking, and eventually they have to say, well, then I guess I'm going to die, right? Everybody gets to that point, but then there's one more question. That's the one Jesus is asking, and then what? So here Jesus tells us the and then what? He says being truly wise, being truly shrewd is, is knowing that you're ready for what's next. And if we realize how important that is, what comes next, that eternity thing, how important that is for us, how important that is for people that we love or people that we know or people that we don't even know but we just come across, that eternity and how and where they will spend that then what kind of an indictment is what Jesus says next? Verse 8. So the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of light are. The children of this world, the, the, the people of this world as opposed to the people of God. He says they show more to dedication. They show more heart. They show more resourcefulness and more effort. Just think of the, the hours and energy that people will put in and, and the sacrifices they'll make and the money they'll contribute to make their business the way they want it to be or to make their lawn look really nice or their house be, be really comfortable or their kids have the right school or, or, or themselves have the, the right style and, and, and the, the right look. Whatever it is that's most important to them wouldn't it be sad? Wouldn't it be foolish? Wouldn't it be silly if, if we didn't put at least as much time and energy and money and resources and, and, and thought into our eternal future, the things of the eternal future as these people do to the things in their physical future and the, the security of their earthly future? Are we as shrewd? Are we as shrewd with the dedication and devotion to, to what really, really matters? Well, Jesus tells us how we can be sure that we're that shrewd with the earthly things God has given us, especially when we remember that it's God's business. It's all God's business. Make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into the eternal dwellings. And this seems hard to understand at first until we realize, oh, yeah, yeah, from what Jesus says, there is no closer relationship. There's no closer friendship than, than that that being together, connected together in Christian love. And that means whatever we do in support of that, whatever supports this, this gospel, good news, this, this gospel ministry that is about telling people the best news of all, that there is this being saved, this being right with God, and that Jesus has done it all for them and wants them to have it. And it comes through this, this faith that God gives in his word and, and builds up in his word and makes stay there in his word that God uses that to expand his business and that God uses us using that to expand his business. Oh, and then it's really easy to see what this management, this administration, this economy, this stewardship, what it's really all about. It's all about something that comes from God's plan of salvation in Christ Jesus and bringing that salvation to us and other people. That's what gives real life meaningful life, even in this life with all the physical possessions that God puts along with it because he gives it to us in view of the eternal life that's in store for us. See, it's only faith that makes it so that the, mass, the manager is commendable, commended by the master. Romans 4, 5 says, but to the person who believes in the God who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. And that makes sense. No, no, that makes us, that makes us God's people. God's people who get this, this privilege and, and this honor and this joy of doing God's business. And by his grace, that's our business. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to confess the Christian faith he has given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you please stand as you are able?
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. 